Good evening, everybody, and this is Free to Heal, and I'm Noreen McClendon, your facilitator, and I just want to welcome you. This is a group where we come together weekly with those that have been incarcerated, loved ones, children, anyone that's been touched in any way by the criminal justice system, and let me just stop there and say I don't know of hardly anybody that hasn't. Everybody knows somebody that has been touched by the criminal justice system. And we try to heal from the ravages of what incarceration has done to those incarcerated as well as the family members, friends, and our communities as a whole. Because when you have so many people taken out of communities, um, it affects the fabric of the community. And we even had someone talk tonight about um Eight out of every 10 people have been directly affected by the system. So we come together. We ask you if you have comments, leave comments. If there are topics that you want us to discuss, by all means, we're on all platforms, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Find us. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. So tonight we had a great discussion and... It's going to lead to a further in-depth discussion about reunification with children, particularly adult children of parents. But before we got there, though, we had a great discussion about um, character defects and how it, it's important. You will hear on Free to Heal over and over and over again the importance of dealing with yourself first and acknowledging your own BS before you begin to point fingers. The less blaming you do and the more internal work you do, the more likely you are to heal, to be able to move forward, and to be able to be uh, a positive influence in society. You'll reach your goals. You'll see things happening much better once you begin to take responsibility, and deal with yourself. Nobody can do to you what you don't allow them to do. So even if someone did something and it caused you pain, that is not what is at the source of your healing and your moving forward. What's at the source of your healing for you is for you to move beyond whatever it was. Forgive yourself. Forgive those that hurt you. But the hardest one is forgiving yourself. So I hope you get something out of that discussion. Then we had a discussion about housing. Now, people coming home from incarceration have for years been challenged in being able to find housing. There's all sorts of legal discrimination in housing these days. And so it's really important to understand that there are reasons for it, uh, particularly in California, it's very tenant-centered. And it was an interesting discussion about why are landlords looking at criminal background these days? Well, these are there are some things that they can't discriminate against, and society's always looking for a way to exclude somebody. But one of the challenges that I face uh, in my day job all the time as a landlord is that we provide affordable housing. I'm the executive director of Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. We have developed over 700 units of affordable housing since 1985. And in housing that many people, what I find is that it is a challenge because the court system makes it almost impossible, despite what's in your lease, to evict people these days for nuisance evictions. Almost the only one that you can get these days seems to be non-payment of rent unless they commit a crime. So it becomes incumbent upon a, a landlord to be very selective about who they rent to, primarily because once you get them, it's very difficult to get rid of them. So there are ways to deal with that, and there's an interesting discussion on on, on housing the formerly incarcerated. We also, one of the things that in that, in that discussion that I want to point out to anybody listening 
it's been my experience that people who have done long periods of time incarcerated tend to just, they don't want trouble. They tend to be the best tenants. They tend to be great workers. Why? Because they know that they need to work and they know that they, and they also tend to appreciate having housing. When it's difficult to obtain something, once you get it, it's more appreciated than if it was easily attained. So I have found just for anybody considering people who have criminal backgrounds, even murders, if they've done a long period of time for that, those are not the same people that went in, the same person that committed that crime or did those things. And it's not to say that everybody comes out rehabilitated and and all better. But I have just found in my experience in working with this population for many years is that those people that did really long periods of time of incarceration are not looking for any trouble. They want to just be able to live their lives and be productive and move forward. So that is something to consider as well. Another issue that came up was, which I find very interesting, it's the first time I've ever heard anybody say it this way, is that when people come home from incarceration that have done a long period of time, they are as afraid of society as society is of them. Did it ever occur to you that the way that you get down may frighten a person who's been incarcerated for a long period of time? I bet it hasn't, but it's the truth. They have fear of society and how people function today because, again, they don't want to go back. They don't want to deal with it. So I think that that is also a very interesting thing that I had never heard before, but it makes sense. And I want people to realize people coming home from incarceration are people. They're human beings. And they have fears and hurt and pain just like the rest of us do. There was a great discussion about the fact that society teaches children and loved ones to be afraid of the person that's been incarcerated. And so we're expected to be afraid of you. We're expected to mistrust is the word that was used. We're expected and trained to mistrust you. And because particularly with people who had addiction issues where society has already acknowledged that relapse is a part of healing from addiction. Well, people that have done that, their children, their behavior, when they relapse, it reinforces society's myth that you have to be afraid of these people, that these people can't be trusted. Just imagine, though, that you're the child of someone who is cycling in and out of jail because they have an addiction. And particularly in minority communities, poor minority communities, addiction to crack and things was never looked at as a public health issue or as opioid addiction has become over the past you know, few years. So that has always been criminalized and criminals are to be punished and mistrusted. And that discussion, think about that if your parent is the one who is cycling in and out and society along with their behavior is reinforcing, I cannot trust my parent. What does that do to the mentality of a child? Those things Those are scars and things that we have to heal from. And this is why we come together every week at Free to Heal so that we can heal from those things because we know that the system is not always right. Just because everybody goes along with it doesn't mean that it was right from the beginning. Um, Another highlight was, and we've talked about this before, when you're... When you come home and reunification with children, particularly adult children, they're going to speak to you from the place of their pain, the pain that they feel abandoned, 
the pain from whatever your absence caused, whether it was going into foster care, going into the home of someone who didn't treat them well. Um, we know that it can create um, circumstances of sexual abuse, child abuse, and all sorts of things when parents are taken out of their children's lives. And so we understand that those things um, will, each child is going to heal at a different rate. And it's all individual, okay? No two children are going to heal exactly the same. Each child has had their own individual experience. And when they speak to you of their pain, understand it's pain that's speaking. And the best advice that I've heard is don't clap back and don't try to defend it. Just listen and take it and allow them to get it out because being able to discuss it with you as the person that they believe caused their pain is the best way for them to begin to heal. But we've talked about that before, the importance of not trying to clap back at your kids and not trying to defend what happened, while at the same time being very careful not to allow children, grown or otherwise, to use the fact that you were incarcerated as a hammer over your head and manipulate you using that because children will do that as well. The only time you're of any use to me is when I'm buying you, doing for you, or, and so forth. And that's not right either. Um, so there's that balance between letting them have their and express their pain and not allowing them to manipulate you and mistreat you and disrespect you because you made a mistake in your life. Because let's face it, we're all going to make mistakes. Every one of us is going to make a mistake. The difference in those that were incarcerated and the rest of us is our mistakes didn't lead to incarceration, let alone years or decades of incarceration. But make no mistake about it. We have all done things that could have gone another way that potentially could have led us to long periods of incarceration. And no parent ever ever woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to commit this crime so that I can destroy the lives of my children and loved ones. Never happened. Okay. They may have made bad choices, but they never intentionally decided to hurt you. Did it affect you? Yes. Was it direct Im impact? Yes. But it was never intended with you to harm you or ruin your life. That was never the intention. OK. Um, another great discussion tonight, and we had, as you can see, we had great topics. But one thing that I thought was really important is utilize the system. The system it has things in place. There are ways that you can rehabilitate yourself, but you have to do it. The system isn't going to rehabilitate you, but they will provide tools if you want to that will allow you to rehabilitate yourself and you're going to have to do the work, but it's okay. But utilize the things that they do provide to get where you're trying to go. Don't hesitate to utilize those tools that are available to you at this point because you have been incarcerated. And another thing that was great, great discussion about one gentleman who didn't have parents growing up was in foster care. He wasn't told a lot that he was loved, but he found a church and the people have cared for him. And what's great about that is, is just to say that there are people in society that do care. There are still caring people, people that will help, people that will embrace you, people that will love on you. We, in fact, our group um, tonight, we had to say a little special shout out to a guy who comes to the group often and he's had a surgery and he's just not in good health. And, and so we all feel the loss and this is not a family member. This is someone that we have embraced. And I say that to say that there will be somebody that will embrace you as well. 
Remember this though, you have to embrace yourself first and you have to think that people will before you'll actually see it manifested. You have to, you cannot walk around believing and having a chip on your shoulder and believing that the whole world is against you. Otherwise, that's what you're going to attract to you. You will see things around you that will solidify your myth or your theory the same way that the system says you can't trust people that were incarcerated and addicts behave or people going in and out of the system for petty crimes. It reinforced that myth. Well, guess what? If you keep walking around believing that the world is against you and nobody will care for you, things, the universe will line up to, to meet your belief. Okay. The universe will show you exactly what you believe in. Uh, and I think this will be the last one for tonight. And th this is something I think that most people don't realize. And we never think about it. When you come home from incarceration, nobody knows that you've been to prison. Now, there are going to be people, there will be behavior, particularly when you come home and you're, you're fresh out, as they would say. There may be behavior that a person who's been incarcerated sees that will give them an indication that you have been incarcerated. But the average person on the street, as the gentleman says in, in, in our session, nobody's walking around with a tattoo on that says, I've been to prison. So nobody knows. You get the opportunity to present yourself how you choose to present yourself or how you want the world to see you. And it also gives you an opportunity. This is a time I've said this before to reinvent yourself. This is when you can create the person that you want to be. This is the opportunity. While it's a challenge, also look at it as an opportunity to have a new life, to live a new way and to be free. And with that, we want you to be freed from the prisons that you have created for yourself in your mind, in your heart, those things that you believe about yourself that have never been true, those things that society would have you to believe that have never been true. We want you to get past those things and be blessed and freed, truly freed from anything that is going to keep you incarcerated in your heart mind and soul and we look forward to having you uh back with us again and again leave your comments and again this is noreen mcclendon and it's been another session of free to heal have a good one good okay so i just want to say welcome everybody to free to heal and tonight we're going to have um a discussion i'm going to i would love to have my my group um, the people that are here that are participating, I want to ask you guys some questions because what I find is, is that peer learning is the best learning. Um, personal experiences um, tend to be the best. And so what my first question was, what's been the toughest challenge that you faced so far, either since you've been home or with your loved one since they came home. And at any, you guys just unmute and go for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, for me, it's, uh, I've been gone so long for as my mom, my dad, you know, really nothing has changed because they raised me, you know, uh -huh. and they know me. Okay. But like my other siblings, it's like, I have to get to, you know, know them again. They have to get to know me again, you know? Yeah. And it's like, what do I say? Other than I love you, I miss you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see you, right? And my sister, uh, Debbie, and my mom, they comes over here, okay? And Mr. Sandoval, he's very, very helpful, right? And uh, she already told him. Don't let him get away with nothing. Stay on him, right? And he's real caring. He's really helpful. I mean, if he's not busy with his schoolwork, come on, Henry. I'm going to take you shopping. I'm going to show you how to use your, you know, your debit card, your EBT card, right? I'm going to show you the right things to eat. 
I'm gonna show you the places not to go, right? Stay out the streets after this time, okay? So I'm very thankful and grateful, and I thank the Lord, first of all, then I thank Francisco Holmes for accepting me here, right? And I have two families, right? And like I said, I'm just so thankful that I'm free, yeah. you know? And like I said, it's gonna take some time, but I done did that already. This time it's gonna be spent free, yes. right? The careless mistakes that I made, they're gone, right? This is a new starting point for me, right? And with all the people I have behind me, mm -hmm. you know, it's no way in the world that I can go wrong. Anything that happens is because of me, not them. The blame game is over. I stopped playing the blame game years ago. Hallelujah. Right? Because I've learned one thing. When I was taking groups, and in there, when I became a facilitator, I bought, it was the number one thing, givens. Whatever choice you make in the world, it's your choice, okay? You have the number one sole position of what you do in life. So anything, it's not him, it's not them, it's not them, it's you, okay? So once you understand that, you're good to go, right? And that was my problem. I've always tried to minimize things, justify. No, that's not gonna get it, you know? So once that's, I understand that, that once you. I understand no. that, and by me constantly going to the board, I took my transcripts and I dissected, okay? Here's where you went wrong, right? I took those words, okay? We, not, we don't want to know what you think and how you feel. We're dealing with facts, and that's what I deal with. And one of my main issues was my character defects, okay? And once I sorted those out, on August 17th, Mr. Chappelle, he said, Givens, he said, look, when you came in here, you was clueless. But now you come before us, he said, who am I looking at now? He said, every question that was asked, there was no hesitation. You kept eye contact and you nailed every question. And he said, it would amaze me. I only see one piece of document sitting in front of you. I said, yes. He said, what is that? I said, I just wanted to bring it to you. This is my AA in child development. You know, he said, can I see it? Yeah. He said, now, he said, when you left here about three years ago, I told, he said, I told Mr. Sharif, the deputy commissioner, when he come back, he gonna get a date. Why? Because he's sincere. You know, this is something that he hasn't been doing. He's telling you straight from the heart. This is something that I see and I can feel it. And sure enough, on August 17, he come back, he say, Bye, you, suitable. you know, what I want to say is uh, the most powerful thing that I heard, heard you say, which I encourage all the time, is um, it, it was internal. You had to deal with your own stuff. Nobody yeah. could deal with it for you. You had to stop blaming everybody else. It isn't. If they hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have done what I did. And no, no, no exactly. more your character defects. You had to live with those and you had to face yourself with those character defects not the board you had to face you with those defects and that's where the healing and that's where the ability to move forward and also something else you said that was powerful is the forgiveness forgiving yourself not just other people but forgiving yourself for those things that you did the choices that you made that caused you to have the challenges that you had and, 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 and being spending all that time away from your family. And with the family, you're going to find that there are, um, uh, you're gonna to have to get to know them again. They're gonna to have to get to know you because the person that went into incarceration is not the person that came out of incarceration. Exactly. Uh, they're two different people. 
And so it's just a matter of understanding that they're different people. And now they have to get to know that person. And you now, believe it or not, are going to have to figure out who you are on this side of the wall. Right. Because that's different even than the person that was going to the groups and learning why you were incarcerated. That was a different universe, all of its own. It had right. its own language and all of those things. So now it's a matter of who are you now? Right. This is this is what you'll get to learn. And it's wonderful because you do have the support system that you have around you. And this is one of those places and those forms that you can come to that will help you when you have questions about things where you can just put it out there with no fear of being judged or worse than that, nobody understanding what the heck you're talking about. Because right. these are people that understand and have been through it. As you can see, we got people been out all lengths of time. Um, and so they will understand what you've been through and, and what it's been like to be you. So um, I'm glad that you shared that. Um, any, anybody else want to share what um, the, the toughest challenge that you faced since you've been home for? Since your came? I will. Okay, Noreen, I will. Okay, go ahead. Can I say something real quick? Sure. Um, I only I only have um four four uh, percent on this on this uh tablet. So I'm not gonna borrow no money. I'm not gonna borrow no money, Rufus. That, that's what's up. That's what's up. But it's been a cut off. So I, that's all I want to say. You know, I because I, I don't think I have enough time to comment on anything. But it's been a cut off in a minute. So okay, y'all have a good y'all have a good night if it cut off. Okay, wonderful. And be well. Be safe. Can you use my line? All right. All right. All right. Uh, no, he did. I he think our big, lie, Carlos. I think I think our biggest challenge is going to be like how you said. You know, if, we, if I was like that when I was nineteen, I came out when I was thirty-five, and it was a big part of my life. It was took in. Wasn't that somebody that end up where they left off? Feel like they got to catch up, or they kind of look at right now and they look at the back path of everybody they knew that grew through that life while we were in, in the other side of the wall. And able to try to catch up and try to able to, to have the nice car. You don't have the nice car, but you're not able to have that because the simple fact is, you know, you was you was taken away. You was you know having to restart over again. Yeah. So all I can say is to everybody is just like you know do the best you can and just keep learning, even though it might be a challenge, but that's going to get you to even a better place than just by just trying to like figure out what's the next your next move. Learn everything you can. Yeah. And, you know, um, time and patience is one of those things that you have to have to get through the reentry process. But at the same time, too, it's like, it's like, I understand because some guys are out during their, in their 50s, during their 60s. So they don't know that's a big challenge for them, you know, from the time they spent in there and from the, the time that they spent, what is, you know, what is their challenge? What is, you know, what is really holding them back from, you know? And it's really sad because a lot of them can't able to do what a 50-year-old could do and a 50-year-old can't do what a 40-year-old could, right. could do, you know? So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I went in at, um, at 28 years old and I came out in my 50s, mid-50s. And when I went in, I had a cell phone that just say incoming and outgoing calls. Now you got all this uh, Google and text messaging and and I still get, no lie, I've been out since 2020, July 16, 2020. I still get in trouble for not looking at text messages because I had a phone in prison, but I didn't look at the text messages because if you want to talk to me, you're going to talk to me and that's it. But now I have to learn to read text messages because it's not just my mom that gets on me or my sister, it's my granddaughter that gets on me. She's 17, during turn 18, and she tell me, Papa, I'll send you a text message. But these are things that us as getting oh, all the time, it's a challenge. It's, you have to catch up. And in your catch up, I didn't say run, I said walk. Stop and smell the roads every once in a while. But I have to learn that this is society. This is society. This is what we have to deal with as individuals coming into society and dealing with 
um, and dealing with the 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 the, the, the challenges like um, like 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 I tell people all the time. I had a uh, I had a job working for Union Pacific. Remember, I didn't tell you on the application. Have you ever been convicted of a crime in the last seven years? I said no. I told the truth. I was convicted in 1995. In 1995, I was arrested in 94. But then they asked me if I was on parole or probation. I said no because I was off at the time. But because it was only two years, they was able to go back and look at my crime, and they 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 let me go from the job because of my crime. My crime was conspiracy to commit murder. So when you remember when we was inside and we was in them classes and they was talking about things that they can do and what they can't do, certain things don't apply. And it's, uh, it's the element of when you get off parole, you have to work on getting your record expunged before you can actually go for a lot of these jobs. Because these jobs, they will say, okay, you off parole, but you haven't been off parole four years, five years. CR England, trucking company, they won't hire you if you just got off parole. They won't hire you for four years off parole. Swift won't hire you for three years off parole. Um, uh, CRST won't hire you unless you got four years off parole. So you have to look at even though we did long extensive time, they still have a period of when you got off parole that counts. Well, and, and one of the things is that the system is just be clear, is not designed um, to make it easy for you guys to reintegrate. It's not designed that way. And every challenge there will you will face every challenge that there is in any way that they can get around whatever laws, like in the state of California, they had the state no longer even ask the question on their applications, but then they can ask it later in the background check. So it's just prolonging the inevitable. Um, you know, if they're if they're gonna hire you, they're gonna hire you. If they're not, they're not. Um, but these are the kinds of things that, like you say, it's, it's an information situation where um, they can say, OK, well, no, you haven't in the last seven years. But then this is going to give us the opportunity to open this back door to be able to do what we was what we, what we want to do anyway. So, um, you know, again, these are challenges, the kinds of things. And we have to pay attention to what's going on. This is why I think the group is good because it gives everybody information. Everybody under the sound of our voices can hear this information and know how to respond to those things. And sometimes it's just a matter of waiting to get that employment until after you've been off for however many years or whatever their requirements are. Uh, make sure that you have waited that the, the appropriate amount of time to apply for those, those kinds of positions. So um, those things are, this is all good information. I wanted to give anybody else one opportunity to go ahead, Ms. Roberta. Um, also, they're now asking, I mean, I don't know if they always did when I filled out the application to move. They are asking if about your criminal background i found i didn't understand that i still don't understand what does that what does my criminal background have to do with me moving i thought it was about um, evictions mm. so i can as a landlord i can tell you part of the challenge um the court system has become very tenant centered so that you, it's almost impossible to get evictions for anything other than non-payment of rent. So once we take a tenant in, um, then we're almost stuck with them unless they commit a crime or um, they don't pay the rent. And that can be problematic. That, that can be very problematic because um, you wind up with people that you don't necessarily want. And people, and like I said, nuisance eviction is almost impossible to get anymore. So now I'm sure people are trying to be much more selective about who they're actually taking <laughs> tenants. Where in the past, if somebody's acting out, you just evict them and keep moving. Um, it's not that simple anymore. Now, um, for our, I only have one building that actually requires me to do a, a criminal background check, and that's our senior building. 
But again, I'm not pressing on for years and years and years to go back. Whatever comes up is whatever comes up. But there are, um, there's a reason I understand why. Because again, when I'm putting you in housing, particularly if it's a duplex or anything from a duplex up, if it's not a single family home, I'm potentially putting my other tenants in jeopardy, depending on criminal background and you know that kind of thing. Now, a lot of people don't know that people who've done long, long periods of time of incarceration, they're not trying to go back to prison, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that they're, the, they're probably gonna be the better tenants you ever wanna have because they're not trying to bring no smoke. They don't want that mm -hmm. smoke. They don't want none of that. They just wanna have a place to stay and be done with it. So yeah, yeah. Well, also that, my other challenge is just still after nine years, still trying to find my place with my adult children. That's still a challenge for me. And so I deal with Tony. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, and and, and yeah. Latanya, she'd be having her feedback for me as well. Cheryl as well. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I yeah. don't know my place. So I'm I'm ready to chime in right there. Um, as I was sitting and listening to everyone, um, and even even you know, going to work at a new way of life. Um having to clean out my office at at and I ran across some papers that I had written um, when I was first asked to start speaking. So I have some stuff that goes dates back to 2002, where I started breaking things down. And um, the biggest comment that I want to make to everyone is society has taught us to not trust you. Society is my biggest co-conspirator in not trusting my mother. Mm. The criminal justice system, you know, from probation to parole to employment to housing, we're taught to not trust you once you go to prison. We we don't, you know, it's we're taught that you don't deserve a chance. You don't, you know, and you're gonna reoffend or you're going to use drugs again or use alcohol again, you're gonna do it again. And as I talk to people at work and, and encourage them to understand the path that me and my mom have taken, you know, I tell them like 10 years into a new way of life, I, I was still sitting there figuring out when my mother was going to, to, to use again I was you know whole waiting with bated breath I was thinking you know at one time my mother learned how to send an email and she got good at it and I started getting emails at one o'clock in the morning and you know then five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking this is going to stress her out she's going to go back and use and I kept fighting with myself and I've been fighting with myself, but I'm fighting with that silent enemy that has taught me, you can get up and go to work every day. You can get up and go to school. You've done these things. You did 30, you know, you worked 33 years at at and Why couldn't your mother do those things? Why couldn't so-and-so do those things? Your uncles do those things. Society is always pressing against us that we're not supposed to trust you, which is so damning because you already have to deal with discrimination in housing, discrimination in, in employment, discrimination in, you know, all of these things. And then you have to learn how to deal with discrimination within your families, discrimination from your children. And I can guarantee you, I don't even have to ask you the question. Your biggest discrimination comes from your kids because I'm a kid and I understand. It. And I want to say this too. One of the things that, that doesn't help particularly um, when you have a parent that used, right? When, when, it, when a parent had an addiction issue, um, it's even harder because their continued use, their cycling in and out of drugs, reinforce what society said that you shouldn't trust them. So every time, so you holding your breath, we've talked about it before that when people come home and this is something for those of you that are new coming home, if your family members are constantly trying to um, 
check on where you are and what you're doing and what are you doing and who are you hanging with and when are you up when they're doing that a lot of it is not about controlling you as much as it is about being afraid that you're going to go back to whatever it was that took you from them in the yeah. first place so even though you know what you're you're going to do and you know where you are your family members and in particular children children don't understand they don't know how it happened and so the thing I would say, like specifically with Roberta, with your children, is a matter of what is what is their hang up and, and, and where are they? In other words, what is the thing for them that is the most hurtful to them? Because that's the thing that um, that's where the root of it is. What was the hurt that your absence caused? As and to, it's in, go ahead. I'm sorry. And it's individual. Yes. You know, as 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 much as it pains me sometimes to hear my mother, you know, talk and she says smart stuff and she looks at me, you know, as if you know I gave her the weight of the world. You know, with Roberta and you know with other parents, they're dealing with multiple multiple children, and so for each child, it's something different. And Roberta, you and I have talked about that. You can't compare one son to the other son or to the daughter or anything. It's absolutely different for each individual. They could be twins, mm -hmm. and each of them will come with a different perspective. One they can say the same things and then one will say well I thought about this or you know or I thought about that it, it's you have to learn the layers of your onion with your children and hone your rehabilitation with them individually as well as with your 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 family collectively it, it's it's going to take an individual you might be trying to use or just by default using a cookie cutter approach because you're still the same mother. You still did the same time. It's no different from one child to the next as to maybe how long you were gone or, you know, at this last time it may be more with the older child or what have you, but there's so many layers to that. And it's an individual conversation. It's an individual healing process, but I can guarantee anybody here, your child will never heal at the rate that you heal. It is always going to be a lag effect. Uh, and, and sometimes it can be huge and sometimes it can be small, but it is definitely individual. But society is just just always teaching us that you, you, you don't matter, that we should throw you away. You know, look what you did to us. And, you know, it, it further exacerbates our pain and our healing process because we're listening to what society is saying and then we're watching you on the other end. You know, if you went to prison one time or five times or it was a combination and all of these these things that are going on with us we're we've we've listened to society you know what society says is really what rules and we have to learn to fight that that persona and come to the perspective that we're going to come to you as individuals and that's where I think that healing begins, but we have to learn how to break that mantra and constantly and, and not constantly be uh, dependent upon what society says because we we have proven that society is wrong. You know, a, re a reporter asked me a question, you know, like, aren't you so proud of your mom and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, shit, if my mother could have done it this year, my mother could have done it 20 years ago. It's not that I'm not proud of my mother. It's that I'm pissed that society had to put her through what they had to put her through for her to get here because mm -hmm. you can be great at any stage, once you learn what greatness is, but society was keeping her down. Well, and it also wasn't providing her any help. I see somebody got their hand up. Go ahead, sir. You got to unmute. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. And I just also want to say, um, just to piggyback on what, what Antoinette is saying, it's, it's like this. When you go to prison, you come out, you got a bullseye on, period. It's a whole bunch of laws that's going to discriminate against you and all that, period. 
you're going to have to catch up with the times. You can't be a dinosaur. I don't care how long you was gone. I don't care how old you are. You're going to have to adjust. Assess, like I say, the three A's. Assess, adjust, and address. Assess what's going on with you and your life and how you change. You already know that you got a bullseye on your back. And you already know that some of the things that you're going to go through in life with the people who love you and who are going to be around you, it's going to be their trauma and their pain and, and, and their hurt coming out, spilling out you. So you got to take that shit on the chin. Don't take that shit personal. Do not clap back at your kids. Just take it because they have the sense of abandonment. They have the sense of you not being there. You know, your presence and, and not presence being there affected their life in a way that you can never even understand. So don't clap back. Just listen. Listen. It's going to be hurtful. It's going to be hurtful for sure. Because it's a place of pain that they're coming from and they're expressing to you. They can't express this to nobody else but you because you're the sole person that caused their pain from you not being in their life. And just understand with the jobs and all of that stuff, one job might not allow you, but go to the next job. Don't stop because certain jobs say we're not dealing with you. Because there's jobs that's going to take you right in the halfway house. It's going gonna, gonna to be jobs that's going to take you with that ankle monitor on your shit. So do not let the, the nose define who you are and, 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 and deter you from, you know, going forward. Because there's going to be a lot of no's. There's going to be a lot of closed doors. There's going to be a lot of, uh, I can't accept you, even with the housing. But you got to go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. Do not let a no deter you from going to get a go. You see what I'm saying? And it's going to happen. And if you've been in prison, you used to being told no. You used to being told hell no. And you used to being told what to do by authority figure. So that shouldn't be hard for you to deal with. But being on the street, just know that you're up against it. Your deck of cards and your cards has been dealt to you. You got to play what you got. Right. So I don't give a damn if you got motherfucking a whole bunch of bullshit and the motherfucker got four aces. You still got to play your hand and make that hand that you got into four aces. So that's just my comment. And that's just how I know I move out here. Because I don't let nobody define what I do and what I can do and what I can't do. Because just because the next person can't do it don't mean you can't do it. And just because you couldn't do it then don't mean you can't do it now. Because things evolve and things in society change. And like Antoinette say, society has demonized anybody that come out of prison. But the pendulum has swung because society sees a lot of people that come out of prison that want it, get it. They want it and they come out here and get it. Those that come out here and bullshit, pussyfoot around, play on it, and try to play on the system, them the ones that give the, the people coming home that want it a bad name. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot more resources out here right now, a whole lot. So utilize these resources and understand, don't have thin skin, don't take a lot of stuff personal. You know, it's just the data. And like she said, they demonize anybody that come out of prison. So just stay focused and be strong. Because you're going to get told of, some no's. You're going to get all of that stuff. One of the things that Terrell said, and I see your hand, Patrick, one of the things that uh, Terrell said is really important is um, that a lot of it is the response to pain. Um, let's not forget what it is that you hear speaking. When people are in pain, it doesn't come out sweet and nice and kind. Um, and just understand that that may be what it is, is pain. And that's why he's saying don't clap back about it. Um, but what I also want to caution you is don't let it be a tool to manipulate you either. Because that will also be a thing. People will use it as a tool of manipulation to get what they want. And children learn how to manipulate their parents from the crib. Okay. They learn how to manipulate. Well, you know, you ever see y'all ever see that movie? Um, Look who's talking. And the baby go, wow. Oh, that, oh, that worked. What? And every time, yeah, because every time I want something, I know if I holler like that, they coming, okay? So uh, also do not allow yourself to be manipulated because you did not wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to commit this crime so I can ruin my children's lives. It never happened, okay? Now, is it a, did something happen? Yes. 
Did it affect them directly? Yes. But don't allow yourself to be manipulated and don't allow them to use it as a, a hammer over your head that every time you look up, they're talking and blaming you. And the only time that they have time for you is when you giving them or when you buying for them or when you doing for them. Because children, children by nature tend to be pretty selfish because they haven't yet learned. But, but just understand that there is a balance and everything that's healthy has balance. But Patrick, I saw your hand and it's getting, I wanted to make sure we, we get to you. Right. Yeah, by yeah. no means, don't be no fool. <laughs> That's a fact. Yeah, you and I have talked about this, that in the last 20 years, eight, eight and a half people out of 10 have been incarcerated in jail, probation, parole, and society is afraid the ones that weren't connected with the courts and everything, that they're going to be next. So we get the stress, the hassles, the no's, but instead of manipulating the system, and we've talked about this, utilize the system. Yes. Be in the right place at the right time. And because of COVID and because uh, younger people, and I'm not putting younger people down, they just weren't taught the work ethic. Right. They weren't taught because we don't have nuclear families anymore. Uh, you're lucky enough just to have one parent take care of you when you're younger, let alone have two. And unfortunately, the school system has failed us because, again, just like 40, 50 years ago, you're not required to do anything to, in yeah. school. School has become babysitting again. And that doesn't benefit anybody. And I'm taking a PTSD with an anger management because basically being in prison 31 years, you get a little angry, you, you get a little stressed out. So you have to deal with that. And what I'm learning is you deal with the bigger stuff first. You don't deal with the trivial small stuff, but unfortunately, some of the trivial small stuff you respond to more quickly. The major stuff where you could burst out and do something major and go back to prison immediately or for a long time, that's what you really have to deal with. You know, don't have the road rage out there on the freeway. Don't pick up a baseball bat and beat somebody down. Sometimes we want to do that. Uh, that doesn't yeah. mean we're going to do that. Like you said, you, tenants and people that were in prison, they don't want to go back. They just want a place to live. They want some peace and quiet. And it's not about respect. It's about common courtesy. And that's something our society doesn't give anybody. Again, society is afraid of us because they're afraid of themselves. Right. They, they almost think like being an ex-felon is like a disease. It's going to rub off. Yeah. Every, everybody in a family has had relatives in prison, in jail, in the court system directly. It's not, you know, like it used to be. And unfortunately, you and I have both said it. We live in a police state. It may not affect you like 1984, but it affects you. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. It's and frustrating as hell to see stuff going on that you can't do anything about. I don't like like the homelessness out there. I don't like road rage. I don't like how expensive it is in California. But unfortunately, since I've grown up here and I'm a native, we're systemically used to this environment, even though from time to time is a bad environment. We're handling it. We don't like it, but we're handling it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's getting kind of kind of late. I wanted to, um, you know, there's a couple other questions that I had and I'm just gonna put them out and as you guys check out, cause I'm gonna come back to everybody, give everybody a chance to, to check out. Um, but these are questions that you might also, um, depending on if you got anything in particular out of tonight or if you would like to expound on these. One of the things I wanted to know is if you've had people that um, understand the way you feel or behave since you've been home. Um, because that, um, when, when you feel like you're alone and you're the only one that knows, have you guys had the benefit of having people that um, actually understand what you're going through? And 
what would make reunification with your family and friends easier? Those are two other additional questions. So, um, so I wanna put it out there and I'm gonna go around and let everybody check out um, and give us your last comments for the evening. And I think what I wanna do um, and be prepared for next week, I wanna spend more time talking about reunification with your children. Cause I, I, I got it, I feel it, I, I hear it. And I know that we need, we need to talk about that a little bit more. We didn't get a chance to go as far into it as I would have liked tonight. But next week, I want us to do that. And I'm going to start um, with you, Mr. Givens. I'm going to ask you to unmute. And um, and anything that you stuck out to you tonight or whatever, any last comments that you'd like to make? Yeah, um, I'd like to answer the question that you made. Um, all my family members, it was a surprise. And I mean, they was, the, the house was crowded. You know, how you feel? I said, uh, First and foremost, hey, I feel grateful to have y'all here. And uh, the number one question that stuck out at me is saying, are you afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid. You scared? Yeah, I'm scared. What do I do? You take one day at a time. Relax. That's what you do. We are here for you, right? Hey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a learning process to get to know us again. But look, hey. You, we're grateful that you're here. Mm -hmm. We're here to help you, okay? We know the boundaries, okay? Just don't overdo it, you yeah. know? I said, uh, make a long story short, I said, but hey, I'm here and I get emotional. I, I, I'm like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. they, gave you, they gave you the way, take it one day at a time one task at a time, one goal at a time, one short-term goal, one long-term goal. You take it one day at a time and be patient with yourself and patient with the process uh, because it is a process. And as you know, just in the discussion tonight, you can see it's not designed for everything to work out smoothly, but that's okay though, because you have done, you've done and survived the worst part of it already. Now you're free. And yeah. that is, and then you're also at the Francisco homes, which is, um, a, for me, a good thing to me from where I said a good thing, because not all of the places that you could potentially go will allow you really to be free. Right. Um, they function like little mini prisons. So yeah. it's a good thing that um, that you're there and you will have to do it on your own, but just be patient with yourself. So I'm grateful that you're here and Thank uh, you. and hopefully you'll get something out of it and come back. Miss Latanya, I wanted to, I see you got your hand up. You can go ahead and, and unmute. Yes, just to answer your question, um, do, do I do I know people that understand or um, speak the same language as I do? Yes, I do. And I'm so grateful to have uh, these people in my life today. You know, I could be myself. I can make mistakes. Um, you know, a new way of life has changed my life to where... Um, and I want to just thank Tony. Thank you, Tony, for lending your mother to me. Um, thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Cheryl. You know, I have people today that I can come with them to with anything and they don't judge me. And it just feels good to have a community behind me like that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that you'll be, I'm sure you'll be adding um you know and helping us along the way as well so thank you for being here and um, we'll look forward to having you as often as you want okay thank you thank you so um mr bradley yes uh what i'm taking away is i realized what i was feeling about society is so much true to me because i'm afraid of society Mm. Society is so crazy out here with the road rage, like the other brothers were saying, so much violence in society. And these are not people you can say out of prison because we don't have tattoos on our heads or signs on our shirt talking about we just got out of prison. So don't nobody know who's got out of prison and who didn't, who haven't been to prison because we haven't said anything. I feel society is wanting somebody to blame. For history, man had always wanted to blame someone else for what they're going through. And so by me going to all these different groups to rehabilitate myself, prison didn't rehabilitate me. I went to groups to rehabilitate myself to become a better man. 
I'm to me, I'm like, I look for that peace in society. In society, I'm like, wow, I'm not going out there tonight. It's crazy out there. I'm not driving. It's so much violence in society that I'm afraid of society. I'm trying to get away from certain places to some places peaceful because, you know, like my kids, my kids, they blame me so much for their situation financially. You know, my kids wanted me to you know, send them money and told me when I get out of prison, I could double up my money. I said, whoa, wait, you get your money, you double up your money. You're not sending me back to prison. And then mama get at me and say, oh, you owe me $12,000 for raising your daughter. No, you owe me 12 million because you screwed my daughters up because you didn't raise my daughter like I wanted them to be raised. You raised them up to thinking a man's supposed to take care of them and not be independent women. And so society, she's a pastor now, Society is so crazy to me, it just it, it's misunderstood. No communication, no understanding. We always want somebody to blame somebody else for what we're going through instead of taking responsibility, it's looking at consequences behind your action. Most of us from being in prison so long, lifers and stuff, we had to do these groups. We had to rehabilitate ourselves. And they didn't make us rehabilitate. They want us to rehabilitate ourselves so we can become a better person so we can understand what's going on, the things that we did in the past, how we hurt so many people. So now we see all this. That's why they let us out to change because we have changed. Now society is going through their problems. You know, a lot of people in society, they're looking for someone to blame. Everybody through the history of man blames someone else for their problems instead of taking responsibility for their own actions. You know, it's the first time it's, you know, what you said is the first time I heard anybody um, actually say it in the way that you said it in terms of, shoot, you afraid of society. Shoot, they're about they scared of you. Look, well, I'm scared of you. You know what I mean? And, and, and rightfully so, because things have changed and people out here crazy. No, they really yes. are society and, and the things that they expect and all of this, it, it is, it's a lot, but thank you for sharing that. And, um, and I'm glad you're, and I'm glad you're with us. Um, that's Mr. why I like this group so much. <laughs> that's all right. Mr. Labrado. There you go. Unmute for me. Unmute. Okay. There you go. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. See you there down there, Willie. Um, yeah, something touched base with me earlier, and it was uh, the, the young Mexican kid that was speaking earlier, and uh, how, and then some of the other brothers were talking about um, the struggle that we have. Saturday, I went for an interview, and I relate with what was said earlier. I went with an in interview with um, Amazon. I was hired and fired at the same time. Wow. Um, wow. They hired me. They said ten to six. They gave me all the, the my 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 hours. The, they were talking about the benefits and everything. They flipped the application around, and she goes, uh, "You've been convicted of a crime." And I go, "Yes," because on the application, I said, "Yes." And then where it says, "Please explain," I said, "I, I mean, uh, um, I forgot what it said. It said, it said, have you been have you been uh, convicted before, or whatever?" And then. It, then it says, uh, please explain. So I said in the interview, I would I would talk about it. Right. So she goes, when did you get out? And I go, January 13th. And she goes, January 13th. She goes, what January? And I told her uh, last month. And she goes, oh, I'm so sorry, honey. I'm so sorry. She was going like this. And I go, excuse me. And then she goes, um, you have to be out for seven years before we can uh, hire you. And I go, excuse me, isn't this a, a felon a felon friendly corporation? And she goes, yes, but you gotta have been out seven years. And I go, well, I haven't been convicted in 30 years. I, I, I've been down for 30 years, I just got out. And she said, uh, I'm so sorry. And I, it kind of like, you know, my the old me, I would have said, you know, fuck it. And, and I would have, you know, I, right away, we all know how to make a quick buck. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, no, you know what, 30 years, nothing's going to, you know, I'm not going to let this discourage me, you know, and um, so it's, 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 it's about keep pushing forward, you know, because eventually yes. something's going to happen, you know, yes. I'm going to get a job or whatever. I'm so eager to work, you know, um, I was on another Zoom meeting earlier with uh, Time Done and uh, Community Healers, Community Healers went ahead and, and placed me on their, uh, on their board as, uh, as the vice president. So I'm going to be doing the gang expert stuff. And, you know, there's certain things that I see there's still light there, you know, and um, 
Uh, it's not it's not about giving up. It's about, you know, keep pushing, you know, and that's where I'm at with it. You know, I'm not I'm not before I would like, ah, the hell with it. I'm going to go get the bag and start selling on the corner or something. Right. Right. You know, where, where's that going to get me right back to where I came from? You yeah. know, and it's 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 not it's you know, the system's not the same, you know, and, and uh, uh, I could care less about going back. What matters to me is family and my freedom, you know, and that's, that's, right. that's where I'm at with it, you know, and and, and um it, I, I was like debating whether I should, log, uh, you know, log into this the, to this Zoom meeting, and I kept saying relationship. Rela- man, I got to get up in there, man. I got to see what this is about. Then I see my old housemate right there, Willie. And I said, "Oh yeah, okay, this is this is work. This will work." But it's interesting. I enjoyed it, and I'll be back next week. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Hall. You want to talk to me? Check out for me, Michael. Did you unmute? There you go. It's a black today. But uh, can you hear me normally? You know what? Um, okay, when you it seems like when you come closer to to the microphone, maybe I can hear you. Otherwise, uh, yeah. what about now? Try it again. What about now? I can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Go ahead. Okay. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. Something that was very interesting for me. Uh. I try to stay. Now back up a little bit again. Back up a little bit because when you was back a little bit, I could hear you, and then when you came forward, now I couldn't. <laughs> Try it again. I don't know. Something is going on. You got a lot of feedback. Yeah. I think it's laptop. I think it's all. You must have a something going on. Mm-mm. It's not working. We're gonna, I'm going to let Mr. Stephens. We're going to see what we can do with you. Okay. You. I'm gonna mute you for now, okay? Mr. Stephens, go ahead. Yeah, uh, that last comment you made about when you feel someone that understands you and show you love. You know, uh, for many years, I I never knew what love was. Nobody ever told me that everything's gonna be all right, uh, that uh, I love you, uh, hug me, and all that thing. But I have been going to a church on Saturdays. And when those people, I, they asked me, said, who were you? And I told who I were and where I came from was prison. And right away, they started reaching out. They said, hey, you know what? We, we, uh, we are so glad that you are born us. You come every Saturday. And they started giving me money. They started giving me leather coats. They, one lady's son died of COVID, and she gave me all his baloney. He had nothing but new stuff. I couldn't believe this. And every week I go, they're saying something that feels nice. They're saying something that feels good. And they come for give it, give it, give it. I have to tell them. But thank you. Uh, but I'll find someone else to give things to because I got too much stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, when you think about what love is, love is caring and giving. I see that now and it feels good. That's wonderful. And, you know, um, you're certainly worthy, uh, Mr. Steffens. Uh, the energy and the spirit I've always gotten from you from day one has always been amazing to me. And I've told you that before, um, understanding your background, um, just knowing, knowing you as, as I do, you know, for the time that you've been in the group, I always get profound things that come from you. And I'm so glad that you found, uh, another family of folks that see and appreciate you just like we do here at Free to Heal. So I'm glad you're with us and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tony. Any, any last comments, sweetie? Um, I will be going uh, with my mom to um, 
the Open Society Forum, and uh, I will be going into a prison with her um, to speak to some of the prisoners uh, from the perspective of the child. And so I always um, now appreciate uh, being able to provide that perspective because I truly do see, you know, how important it is uh, that parents, in no matter what the level, truly understand uh, what it is that their children are going through and, and how we can come together and heal together and, and not, not, you know, do this war um, by ourselves. Yeah, because you was definitely at war. You, you've been at war for a long time. And, and, oh, and, yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm I've been at war since I was about three, four I years know. old. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's yeah, why I'm glad that you got a place and now you got a different perspective you know, exactly. a different, like you get your mom's perspective or at least some semblance of oh, yeah. what has happened to her and how she's absolutely. Yeah. So this yeah. Is what I want to say to, to, you know, all, all, everyone is, you know, at some point in time, I realized and recognized that my mom was a victim just as much as I was. Yeah. And I think that is one of the most important things that you can learn and understand as a child is that, you know, like you said, you know, my mother didn't wake up, you know, trying to be a criminal or, you know, being on, you know, substance abuse and, and other things. She was backing into that process uh, the same way, you know, I came with her, you know, hand in toe. And so understanding that piece is, is how much we were victims to this uh, Mm -hmm. to this process, uh, this intentional process. Absolutely. And I think that that helps us, us with the healing process. Thank you so much. Miss mm -hmm. Roberta. Um, um, yeah, Tony, thank you for that. I just hope one day, uh, especially my baby boy will understand that. And, and not even me saying I'm a victim because I hate to say that, although I was um, in, in, in a lot of aspects, but I just appreciate you tonight and, and the rest of you guys too. Mr. Stephens, I always think about you for whatever that reason is, I do. That's wonderful. Thank you. Terrell. Well, I'd just like to tell everybody to, you know, to stay focused. We all been victimized in some form or fashion. You know, this is how this their grand scheme has been and how it's been designed. But we are kings and queens and we strong and we're going to rise above all of the bullshit that they put us through. And just know that like like the brothers doing, continue to create a support system for yourself that you're comfortable with, because this is a loving world out here. There's still a lot of great people out here. You just got to get to those places and, and, and deal with those people. So. Don't let the crazy people out here. and Because I'm scared of some of these people in society, too, because I'm scared of what they make me do. And I, yeah, you know, I stray away from them. So, you know, and, and you got a right to be scared because a lot of them is just walking around blacked out. But, but for the most part, just keep going forward and, and stay strong and be focused. And, and don't allow nobody to, 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 to put your light out. Keep your light going strong. That's awesome. And can you... Can you give Junior a hug for me? Well, I dropped him off about hour, about 30 minutes ago. But okay, I, he, he was on here, and I told him everybody said hi. Up, you know? you? Next time you see him, hook <laughs> me up. <laughs> Miss Die. Oh, okay. I missed a lot. I missed some of it because I had to leave. But um, I want to say to everyone, just stay focused because we all been through something, and just keep your head up. Thank you, sweetie. Mr. Kit. Not sure if he can. Can you unmute Kittredge? To speak. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Uh, this is real simple for me. Uh, I learned this and I, I, I try to spread it to everybody. Hurt people hurt people. Heal people heal people. Hallelujah. And I'm healed now. Hallelujah. And I'm, spread, and I'm spreading the healing around. You are right with me, here, kid. I've been out here three years. I've been, been out here three years now. And I didn't have every difficult you could have, but I didn't have every door locked out that said I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. 
but I've done it. That's all right. I'm glad you're here with us. Carlos, I didn't get your check out, sweetie. Yeah, well, I'm kind of my, I'm kind of deaf right now from all the noise right here at work, but uh, I mean, I have a lot of people to support me. You know, I lean to those that I know from prison that are ex-lifers. I believe that's the best support besides my family, you know, because they, like you said, they they know who I am. They've been through what I've been through, and we went through the same struggles, you know, and some of them were in the same yard for years, and uh, so that's who I lean to, and as far as uh, we, the first question that you asked us, like, I just got to a point, I got tired of hearing my family always telling me, stay out of trouble, don't go here, don't go there. Like I told them, like, I know what to do. I already know what to do. I'm not a little kid no more. Just trust me. So to answer the third question, I think I still got to continue to do what I'm doing so they can see like, okay, he got it already, you know? That's what it is. That's what and, it is, Carlos. And, and, it's going to be the consistency. Let me ask you this. I just have to ask you, did you go in and out? As a juvenile, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's uh, why. So, so you, you, you know, like as parents, you're not going to never outgrow being a kid to, to your right. family, to the older people, right? So when right. they look at you, they still, even though you know you're a grown man, they still see the little juvenile who was doing stuff that did, they don't understand what has transpired over the 20 some years or whatever it was that you were gone. So they don't have that, that they don't have that insight. And again, it's the fear um, and it's what right. they're used to. And as Tony said, they're, the society has programmed them to believe that you're going to go back. You're not going to, because uh, we already know they don't intend for you to rehabilitate yourself. One of the things somebody talked about that is the rehabilitation. They don't intend for you to rehabilitate yourself. It was, it was Lionel. You got to rehabilitate yourself. Right. Whatever that's going to be, you're going to do it. Now they have started to provide some opportunities and some tools for that. But you got to fight to get those, you know, on the inside. I mean, at CIW right now, everybody I talk to is like, why is CIW not letting any groups back in there? I mean, people are just tripping like, what is it? Why are they not? And it's like whoever the CRM is right now is just not is refusing to let anybody in that's actually helping people. So they make it difficult. Um, but again, it can be done because you guys have done it. I want to give you an opportunity, Miss Cheryl. Any last comments? Okay, so again, um, today is the day I walked out of prison 10 years ago, and I'm happy and, and pleased to be out. And I said the only way I'm ever going to go back is if I go in to talk. And that and I, I think is a possibility that I'll be going in with Susan to the um, Dublin Federal Prison in a couple months. But when I read the new Jim Crow, I understood why I had I was reading it while I was incarcerated and said, this is why I have to, I understand now why I had to be in prison for so many years, because it's by design. All of it's by design. Tony was talking about that. Terrell was speaking of, um, of that in a sense that for me, it's our, our environment and our circumstances that lead us to the place where we are. The expectation of other people to us who live in, the poverty stricken areas, they're expecting us to be a certain way. And then when we go to prison, they're expecting us to be a certain way when we come home because prison has that connotation of that you guys are just, you, you went there for a reason, you must be there for a reason. That's what people always say. We had a lady one time that came and, and she came to church the Sunday before the week she was gonna be released. And she said, I always thought people who went to prison were bad until I came here. And that's what I always tell people. When you get there, you see mothers, sisters, daughters, aunties, your neighbor, your cousin, your best friend. And that's a thing that society doesn't understand. They just think that we're actually pariah to the society because we've done something wrong. And it's not always true because like I said, the chaplain, when I worked in and Dublin said, just because you make a bad choice doesn't make you a bad person. And that is so in incredibly important and powerful because people can say, they can always say, I can guarantee you I'm not going to commit a crime, but you can't guarantee you won't be convicted of one. Yeah. Um, well, there is we, no, there's a, there, there, and that's two totally different things. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can be innocent 
and still wind up incarcerated. That's so right. it's important for people to realize that. James, any last comments? Just keep your head up one day at a time. Stop the smell of rose and understand you are who you are. Date you before you try to date someone else. <laughs> wonderful. And I just want to say Another thank you special. to everybody. Um, it's been another wonderful group. I can't wait next week. Next week, we're going to really unpack a little bit more that reunification, um, reunification with children um, and tap on that a little bit more because it's really important. And I hope that you all will join us next week at Free to Heal. Check us out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, check yeah. us out yeah. and we'll see you guys next week. Congratulations, Cheryl. Let me see you just walk, 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 walk. Hey. walk. <laughs>